What's the word, y'all? NBA season is around the corner. This is the best time of the year. The, the leaves are changing colors. The, the temperatures drop. I was coming home from the podcast. I saw a dude in a Michael Myers mask already. I think about it. That might have been him. Scouting. Huh. Okay. But NBA ball is back. Preseason is on, which means that this channel is back. Y'all know if you've been around for some years, once we get to the daddy off season, I usually just use this channel, just chill, focus on some other things. But I'm covering the game of basketball on a whole different level this year. I just have so many outlets, so many opinions, so much basketball to be consumed, and I, I'm locked in better than I than I ever been. So yeah, I'm here, y'all. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. I talked about having different outlets. The Kenny Beaton Podcast is one of them. We just dropped a new episode this morning. Links will be in the description. We basically broke down the Western Conference and tried to figure out what teams are going to make it, what teams won't, because... There are a lot of good teams out west. Uh, and I appreciate your support. This is a completely independent project. It's just me as a producer producer on talent. I'm doing everything right now. So I appreciate your support. We're trying to become the number one basketball podcast in America. And I can't do that without y'all. Okay, let's get it. Earlier today, the annual NBA GM survey came out. If you don't know what this is, for the last 22 years, uh, they've sent out surveys to all 30 NBA teams, GMs, and said, hey, answer this group of questions. There's 50 questions, and every year on this channel, we kind of dissect it and, and make fun of GMs. I'm not in a position to make fun of GMs, but I am in a position to, to make fun of GMs, if that makes sense. Now, I think we all came to the realization years ago that these GMs don't take this seriously. I'm sure there's a percentage of them that do, but for the most part, they might be delegating this survey to somebody else because it's a completely anonymous and it, it doesn't hold any water whatsoever, but I always find it real fun, and we're going to have some fun together reacting to the, the GM survey. Shout out to John Schumann again. He's been doing some amazing work kind of putting this together. So I, I want to I wanna approach this differently. We're not focusing on the top ends. We will talk about them, but more focusing on the other stuff, and I'll explain that a little bit. The first question is what team will win the NBA Finals? The Boston Celtics and the Denver Nuggets are tied with 33% of the vote, which is fun. Obviously, the Denver Nuggets didn't make any big-time splashes like the number one team, the Celtics, or the number three team, the Bucks, or the number four team, the Suns, but they hold that respect coming off an NBA championship, even if they've lost some key components. I just think once you win, you deserve it. But I can't lie. If you ask me right now, I'm, I'm probably voting this as well today, given good health. The Celtics look crazy. I think the super fun part is like, who voted for the Clippers? Listen, could they? Absolutely. They, they could. They could. They could. I don't want to act like this team is at the bottom of the barrel. But they don't really, on paper, compete with some of the other teams. It feels like the teams around them have caught up to them. So I don't know if there's a rule in the GM survey that you can't pick your own team. Maybe this is GM of the Clippers said, dang, we got it. You know, back in 2021, they had 11% uh, uh, of the vote. I didn't realize that the Lakers had 81% of the vote in 2021. Obviously, they heavily disappointed. But the Clippers have always been a team that got some percentage. And this is a year where I expected it to kind of go away. Um, but they, they still have believers, which is fine. That first year of them getting together, almost half of the GM said the Clippers are going to be it. And as you can see, it went from 40% to 30% to 11% to now, what is it, 3%. Um, but, but the fact that it's even 3%. They still got believers out there, which is which is dope. What player win MVP? Nikola Jokic gets a lot of the praise there. Uh, but I like to see the other people receiving votes. So there are GMs across the league that say, hey, this is Anthony Davis's year. This is the year of Shea Gilgis Alexander winning MVP. Again, he was an All-NBA first team player and he's nice. But I didn't expect a GM across the association to think that he would have a season that would put him into MVP, so they must be really high on OKC because traditionally to win MVP, you have to be a top player on the top team. Of course, you have the Jokic year and uh, the Russell Westbrook year where they weren't the top seed, but for the most part, you have to be a top seed and they might think it's uh, Shea Gilles Alexander, I guess. If you were starting a franchise, who would you sign? Jokic again, on mid-20s, two MVPs already and the NBA champion. It makes sense for him to be number one. Um, he takes the crown away from Giannis, who had dominated this question over the last couple seasons. And then Victor Wimbanyama, of course, he's a 19-year-old stud. And if I'm starting an organization today, I want the guy that has the possibility of giving us seven years of greatness. You know, uh, full rookie contract. And he's that nice. Yeah, I understand that. But again, some people take Joel Embiid, Shea Gibbs Alexander, Jason Tatum, only getting um, a few votes is interesting because, again, he's only 24 years old and he's been really good throughout his career. I know he's had his ups and downs come playoff time, but for the most part, I, I would expect him to be a little bit higher. Anthony Edwards sneaks in at fifth, 7% of votes. Which player is most likely to have a breakout? Anthony Edwards makes sense. Again, the stud. All of these guys make sense for breakouts. 
what doesn't make sense is why is Kyrie Ir- who voted for Kyrie Irving to have a breakout like he's not been all NBA multiple times breakout this is why we do this GM survey this, that is a general manager that did not take this seriously all of the crazy young talent across the association they said we, we think the 31 year old point guard is going to break out even though he's been all NBA before these ones blow my mind every year blow my mind every year now I ain't seen it yet but I promise you I know it's going to upset me best point guard in the league we can agree is Steph Curry for the most part Lucas Shea Dame makes sense Best shooting guard in the league, Devin Booker, Steph Curry shooting guard, Luka Doncic shooting guard, Jason, there's a GM across the association that looks at 6'9", Jason Tatum, and, and, and sees who he plays with and said, that is a shooting guard in the association. He played with, with Marcus Smart, Derek White, Jalen Brown, but Tatum is the shooting guard. That makes no sense. And even a small forward, Luka Doncic, small forward. What is happening? What is happening? Power four, oh, they said, yeah, dang, Giannis dominating that position. And then center also dominating that position. Anthony Davis and Joel Embiid both get votes, but 93% is crazy. What seems that the best moves this offseason makes sense. If you were asking 100 NBA fans who's going to win the Eastern Conference, I would assume that 95% of them would have an answer of the Boston Celtics or the Milwaukee Bucks. And that other 5% might be somebody that's hanging on to hope of the Miami Heat after going on their crazy run last season. Or maybe they believe that James Harden and Embiid, if they stay together, they can make it happen. But, but again, for the most part, a great majority of NBA fans after this offseason would look at Boston and Milwaukee and say that is the team. So it makes sense that they would share the best offseason. Um, the Indiana Pacers for best offseason, Jairus Walker, Bruce Brown, Obi Toppin, all acquired or drafted, which is very interesting. The Dallas Mavericks get in five, 7% of the vote from best offseason. Again, I, I want to remind people the way this works is that you don't give your top three. You're giving the number one answer. So 7% of GM saw what the Bucks did. They saw what the Celtics did, and they said... Grant Williams and re-signing Kyrie Irving and, and getting Omax Prosper and, and Derek Lively is better than acquiring Porzingis and Drew Holiday. It's better than acquiring Damian Lillard. 7% of GM said that or believe that. You know, uh, I can understand the Portland Trailblazer one better because, again, that Dame trade looks great on paper. We got to see what it turns into, what those draft picks turn into. But again, it's it's just interesting to see the Dallas Mavericks. What single player would have a biggest impact? Damian Lillard gets almost 50% of the vote. Yusuf Nurkic got a vote as a guy that, that the one player acquisition with the biggest impact, Yusuf Nurkic. Like some GM, again, I, I keep, keep on to remind you, these are the people that get paid to build the rosters and make championship teams. There's a GM on the on the, the panel that saw the Suns did and said, Bradley Beal is dope. But I believe that Yusuf Nurkic is going <laughs> is gonna to have a bigger impact. This all, That's crazy to me. This is a good one. This is a great collection of talent. Most underrated acquisition. Marcus Smart makes a ton of sense. Former DPOY, one of the best defensive players in ball, going to a team that lost their starting point guard for 25 games. He is the embodiment of the idea of Memphis grit and grind. They very similar to Tony Allen going from Boston to Memphis. The difference is Marcus Smart is well, well better, so much better um, than what Tony Allen was offensively. So yeah, I, I like this one. This would have been my pick as well if I was given this survey. But you also got people thinking they're like Obi Toppin. Yeah, I can see Obi Toppin having a good year. Uh, Sasha Vizenkov, who we really like. And we watched him in preseason. Look really solid. Um, Miles Bridges coming back, I guess. Uh, but but yeah, it's, it, I believe in Marcus Smart as well. Team that would improve the most. OKC Thunder. Yeah. 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 I can see it. I can see it. There's one GM that loves Grant Williams. Simple. Simple. Because he also got votes and what is the most surprising move this offseason. I don't think that was very surprising that it all ramped up to end up being in Dallas. You know what I'm saying? Uh, maybe I'm tripping, but th that's what it felt like. Even though I want to talk to him one day because I know the Bulls were in on that and he was close to signing with the Bulls. And I want to kind of understand what that what that was like because he could have been a Bull, honestly. 3% of GMs think that Sasha Vizinkov is going to win Rookie of the Year um, over Scoot, Chet, and Victor Wembanyama. Well, he's got the most professional basketball experience out of them. I get, oh man, Victor Wembanyama got a lot of experience professional ball. Now that I'm thinking about it, but I, again, I'm a believer in Sasha, but not a believer to think that he's gonna win Rookie of the Year. This is the best part. Which rookie will be the best in five years? Ninety percent of GMs say Wembanyama. Scoot gets a vote. Chad gets a vote. Amin Thompson gets a vote. I love that. Five years ago, GMs were asked this exact question, and they said DeAndre Aiden and Jaron Jackson Jr. That's huge. Because if you remember, DeAndre Aiden was the first overall pick in the draft that had Luka Doncic, Trey Young, so on and so forth. 
So as of right now, five years into their career, it's not even a question who's the best player from that draft class, Luka Doncic, right? But five years ago, when these guys were drafted, GMs across the association would hire on DeAndre Ayton than Luka Doncic. And they believe that in five years, DeAndre Ayton will be dominating, and he's not doing that. So it is always just fun to kind of have that revisionist history because right now it doesn't make sense to think that Luka wouldn't be better. But in the time, people were very high on the impact that DeAndre Aiden could have in basketball. And maybe he still ends up getting that impact that those GMs thought. But obviously, it's been Luka Doncic and Jaron Jackson Jr. Has an, uh, as a number two, I guess. But that draft also had Shea and some other great players. So maybe it's not Jaron. But still, Jaron's in the conversation, to say the least. Which rookie was the biggest deal? Makes a ton of sense to have Cam Whitmore because he was projected to go like number five. He fell at 20. Hey, 10% of GMs. And I'm not even mad at it. It says the school Henderson was the biggest deal because most people, big boards, had Vickett and Scoop. And then Brandon Miller slid into number two for and ended up getting drafted number two. But 10% of GM said, hey, three was too low for Scoo Henderson. He is going to be a stud, and I can't be mad at it. Imani Bates got votes. Okay, Imani, good luck, good luck, good luck. Ah, defense. Now, if you know me, defense is a thing that I care about the most in the game of basketball. I'm a sicko, and I, I enjoy watching great defense over great offense. I know, I, Yeah, believe me. Who is the best defensive player in the NBA? Giannis makes a ton of sense. Drew Holiday makes sense to get some votes. Draymond, Marcus Smart. Jaron and Kawhi. Uh, Kawhi getting 7% in 2023, 2024, he, he, he's, he's not in this conversation. Does that mean he's a bad defender? Does that mean he's not well above average? Absolutely not. He's still great. But the question is who is the, who is the best? And if you ask me, between Kawhi Leonard and Anthony Davis in 2023, who impacts defense more, I'm saying Anthony Davis. If you ask me, Kawhi Leonard or Bam Adebayo, who didn't even get a vote, Lou Dort got a vote over Bam Adebayo. If you ask me, Bam Adebayo is a, is a more impactful defensive player today in 2023. There's nothing to do in 2021, 2020, but now, today's game, it's Bam over Kawhi and Anthony Davis over Kawhi, in my personal opinion. If you still got Kawhi, it makes sense. Kawhi's still great. But I'm just surprised to see Kawhi get the edge above some of the people that have just done it better over the last couple seasons. Best perimeter defender, Drew Holiday. I think we can all agree there. Love to Alex Caruso. Got some votes. Jimmy Butler. Yeah, somebody's really high on Lou Dor. And again, he's a good defender. But is he the best perimeter defender of ball? Probably not. Best interior defender. Um, Anthony Davis ends up fourth here. Jaron, Rudy Gobert. Rudy Gobert still getting a lot of love, which is cool. Um, he had 83% of the votes last year, and now he's only down to 17. So he definitely fell off defensively. Even the advanced that say that he's not as good. He wasn't as good last year compared to the previous years. Um, but he had a stranglehold on things last year. And yeah, I didn't, not anymore. Most vers versatile sees Bam at three. Okay, at least Bam got his name mentioned because that that's the first time his name's been mentioned all, all throughout this entire thing. And the best defensive team, 100%. Boston Celtics. I'm actually surprised to see the Lakers not be top five. And again, these are other good options. I think that the Lakers probably will be better defensively than the Bucks this season. I just look at what they did the second half of last year defensively and say, hey, if they can replicate that. The personnel is the same, you know. Um, but yeah, the, these are not bad options whatsoever. The Nets is actually interesting, but Nicholas Claxton and uh, Mikael Bridges are two of the top players at their position defensively. So I, I makes that makes sense. Coaching. It's all Spolstra. <laughs> it's all Spolstra. Best coach in the league, Spolstra. Be best at motivating people, Spolstra. Uh, best at in-game adjustments, Spolstra. Come on, man. But offense is Mike Brown, which is great. But because Mike Brown, he was we was signed. Mike Brown has notoriously been a defensive-minded coach throughout the entirety of his coaching career. But because he was a part of the Sacramento Kings and their offense was so elite this year. That narrative has completely changed. He's not a defensive-minded coach anymore. He's the best offensive coach in ball. And he learned, I mean, he even said it before, he's learned a lot after being an assistant on the Golden State Warriors and a lot of their philosophy. So it makes sense to see the evolution. But it is just interesting to see him be a guy that was known as defensive-minded to now being number one in offense and the defense is supposed to, again, the domination. The most fun team to watch. Okay, Denver, Warriors, Kings, Suns, great top four. The Celtics, Pacers, Lakers, Bucks, New Orleans, and then OKC. I think they got it right here. There's no team. I'm like, really? All of these teams should be really, really fun this season. Home court advantage, Denver. You saw it in the playoff. They didn't lose. They did not lose at home. And they also got the advantage of being a mile up ahead of everybody, um, the altitude and all of that stuff. Which team will have the most efficient offense? 
Somebody voted Miami Heat. And we got love for the Heat, obviously. But the offense efficiency is not where their strengths are. Just, just isn't. To think that you believe that their offense is going to be better than any of these teams up here is blasphemy. I don't even know if I'm using that word right. It's crazy. How about that? It's, it's, it's ridiculous. But one GM definitely thought that. Promising young core, you can't get past OKC. Shea, Giddy, J-Dub, Chat. that's as good as you could get as a young core. And that doesn't even account for the exterior dudes who also are really good. I like that. Who is the most versatile player? Uh, I, I, this one is interesting to me. I, I would say it's Giannis too. If you ask me, I would say Giannis. But to see some of these other names is, is interesting because I guess it depends on what your definition of vers versatility is. Uh, because I believe, and this is maybe untraditional, Jokic is a versatile NBA player. You know what I'm saying? But he only got a few votes in comparison to some of the other ones. Game on the line, who's taking the shot? Steph Curry. Yeah. Jimmy Butler and Jokic tied for fourth. Luka gets one. I'm actually surprised to see Luka not in the top five. Luka has had a lot of very big clutch moments in his young NBA career. You got the game winner in Portland in his rookie season. Of course, what he did to the Knicks um, with the missed free throw to get his own board. Like, he's got a lot of clutch moments like that. Off Playoff basketball against the Clippers. Um, but, but to see him not be top five is interesting. Uh, but they got two. They got number six and number seven. And then which change will require the biggest adjustment? The player participation policy, 100%. Hundred percent. We're we're going into the era of the the anti rest era. That's what we're going into. You know, five six years ago we had thirty to forty players every season that played eighty two games. This year I think it was like ten, and they're trying to get back to players playing regularly. So it will take a long time to adjust. There will be owners across the association that are willing to pay the fines to have their players be rested. But for how many years? How long before you like my checkbook? It's not worth it. You know, we'll see. Let me know what you think about the GM survey. What was the craziest thing and what was the best thing and so on and so forth. Put your own survey together in the, in the comments section. Uh, what would you answer some of these questions? I'll be down there.